Hello, um, everybody. <laughs> Sorry we're late. Um, being sustainable apparently is a very <laughs> consuming job, <laughs> um, which we'll get more into. Um, welcome to New York Fashion Week and to this talk that we wanted to do with you on less is more and some kind of, I think, hacks and tricks and ways that we can just try to be more sustainable and evolved and conscious in our lives every day. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and this is because of Allie Bird sitting right there, who, when we came for the last conference that they did, we were so inspired, and she was like, you need to be making this happen, and so we manifested it, and with our subject journal that my husband and I started um, a couple years ago now, uh, we are here. And the idea with subject, when we started it, was I have had, and I have had, and I have access to this crazy, beautiful, weird, talented network of extraordinary individuals who inspire me and challenge me. And um, I didn't see in the, um, well, I saw white space, quite frankly, and I wanted to fill it with um, the idea that people should be the ambassadors of their own stories and that I had found repeatedly and in ways that were frustrating to me that people's voices were being taken away from them, which is the number one way to feel alive. If you don't tell your own story, then somebody else is going to tell it for you. So that's why we're here, and the, this is our first panel that we've done, and I'm so, so excited. And I'm so excited that it's with Lauren Singer. The, um, she owns, a, how, would, how would you ex describe uh, <laughs> the package-free shop? Package-free. Um, uh, our mission is to make the world less trashy through selling products that help people reduce waste in their everyday lives. Less trashy is a good place to start, I think. And besides that, you can also find Lauren. She has an Instagram called Trash is for Tossers, which is if you don't if you don't want to sleep at night, get get on there. And <laughs> it's a it's a black hole that's in, actually very inspiring in the end and um, has way too many practical solutions to address in one day. But we'll try. Um, and Willa Fitzgerald here is a friend of mine who is an activist and an incredibly talent talented. Um, actor and creative mind force in our community today. And she's just getting started, but um, both of them have very um, interesting background stories, which I think you might like to hear a little bit about. Um, Lauren, can you tell us how you got started on your mission? Um, thank you guys for coming. This is the coolest room I've ever spoken in. <laughs> very uh, sexy. <laughs> I feel like I ran in here, literally just changed in a bathroom and came and sat in this hole in the floor. So this is really cool. Um, my story began really when I was studying environmental science at NYU. Um, my passion in life is creating large-scale positive environmental change. And uh, when I was in college, just hearing about all of the problems that were plaguing the planet kept me up at night, and I wanted to do something about it. So studying environmental science was kind of the way that I thought I could use my power as an individual to make a positive impact on the planet. Uh, but I, I thought that you know, learning about and talking about and proselytizing about sustainability was enough, right? I thought that caring meant that I was doing something good. But I realized through being an environmental science major, participating in the anti-fracking movement and protesting that there was a huge misalignment between my values for environmental sustainability and my day-to-day -day action. So while I cared about sustainability, while I cared about the environment, uh, my refrigerator was full of plastic. It had my pre-washed greens and my milk in plastic and my eggs in plastic and all of my condiments in plastic. My bathroom had all of my beauty products that were packaged in plastic, all of my cleaning products packaged in plastic, and then all of my clothing was made out of synthetic fabric because fast fashion was really big in 2012, whenever this was. It's um, still very big. <laughs> and, and I realized, I had been protesting against and fighting for, um, you know, protesting against the oil and gas industry and fighting for the environment for three years at that point. It was the center of my universe, but I was actively subsidizing the industries that I hated and I was living against my values every single day, dozens of times per day through my consumption habits. And I realized that um, that was really bad and really hypocritical. And so I decided to stop using plastic altogether and I tried to do that by walking into a CVS and saying, I'm going to buy all of my beauty products and cleaning products without plastic. Um, I don't know who's been in a CVS lately. Very yeah. Recently. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It was not possible. I don't think it's yeah. possible still. Um, and so I realized that I couldn't just buy my way out of plastic, that I had to 
actually try to start making my own products. So that's how I learned to make things like my own toothpaste and my own cleaning products. Um, from there, I learned about the zero waste lifestyle, which is the lifestyle that I've been living for eight years now. And that means not sending any trash to landfill. And for mm -hmm. me, zero waste was the most empowering, inspiring thing that I had ever come across because it was the first time that I had the ability to live my day-to-day -day life in alignment with my values for environmental sustainability. So. Uh, I started living a zero waste lifestyle eight years ago. Mm. All of the trash that I've uh, accumulated can fit within a 16 ounce mason jar. And, and really uh, so great. what I've tried to do through Trashes for Tossers is show that no matter who you are, uh, what your interests are, if you voted for Trump or for Clinton, um, the, the woman one, um, uh, you can have the power to reduce your waste. You don't have to be a stereotype of any type of person to care about the environment and it can be, uh, cool, fun, easy, simple, cost-effective, and improve your life. So, so that's what I've been doing through Tashes for Tossers and what we're trying to accomplish through Package Free. It's interesting to me, though, because if you're, you're a wonderfully eloquent and articulate person, um, but you having a life where all of your waste fits in a jar, that sounds very... Um, I, I, that sounds difficult, I think, probably to most people um, who are living in a city and traveling and have kids with diapers and all that. Um, so I, I would really love to get into, and I know that you are so talented at this, the, um, the little ways that we might be able to make small changes to help us. Um, and before doing so, I also want to speak with, with you, Willa, number one, about your background and how you got started and the many ways that I know that you are a very evolved and conscious and um, person and supportive of sustainable practices. But um, beyond that, like, it's important to me because I can't say sitting up here that I live the same life that Lauren does. I would very much like to and every day is a journey and hopefully we'll find smaller or even better ways to get there. Um, but it's important to me to also examine the, the consciousness angle of that. And I think being an evolved conscious person goes hand in hand with that sustainability lifestyle and practice. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how you started um, <clears throat> just like living a lifestyle. Living, being a human. Um, yes. How were you conceived? No, I do not lead a zero waste lifestyle, although I've always, I've, I've known Lauren for a while and I'm very much in awe of all of the choices that you make and inspired by them and making my own that kind of emulate them. Um, but I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and I grew up to parents who, uh, were like OG hippies and, um, they, I mean, they were really, I think, the inspiration when it came to beginning to be aware of the environment before most people were aware of the environment. Um, we had raised beds in our front yard growing up uh, in the South, which was literally like no one. It was like we were the talk of the neighborhood. Um, we like grew our own food. Yeah, my parents also like made yogurt before you could buy yogurt at the grocery store. Um, and also I, I had never bought new clothes um, as a kid until I was, I mean, until I got to that age where I was like, it, it, I have to buy ex new Explain clothes. that, actually. I don't understand how um, that works. I, uh, my parents exclusively shopped at the Goodwill and Salvation Army and thrift stores in the South. And uh, I was telling the story the other day, actually. My mom found for me at the Goodwill in Nashville, Tennessee, I think when I was eight years old, like a child, a pair of Chanel pants um, that I think at the time were That's the, um, $20. That's the urban myth. <laughs> yeah, $20. $20. Yeah, exactly. $20, though, at Goodwill is like a lot of money. And so my mom like bought this pair of Chanel pants for $20 and whatever, 2000, 1998, and for her child, and was like, you're gonna wear these one day. And I was like, what? And like, they fit me perfectly, and I own those pants, and I wear them all the time. Oh and so I think that like, I, I think that that was where it all started for me. And I think I also had a moment as a child where I kind of rebelled against it because you always rebel against whatever your parents are telling you. And so I like wanted limited to, and I wanted to like go to not the like hippie health food store. And I like wanted to eat at McDonald's, but I think that, you know, that period was relatively brief. And now looking back on it, the foundation of kind of awareness was there from a young age. And I do think that I mean, I think that there is like an interesting divide, right, between the actual changes that need to happen 
on like a large scale global political level in terms of st sustainability and the policies that are enacted. And also like just the kind of the ways in which we can live our lives as individuals and both feel um, more empowered and therefore more likely. I think as soon as you take a step in the direction of empowerment in the direction of like being able to stake a claim on like the choices that you're making, it kind of has a cascading effect. So like you don't have to go zero waste if that's not something that seems cap like possible for you in this moment, but even making those little changes might make you more likely to go vote or to go to the rally. It just like, it kind of is like a, I don't know, it's like a mindset thing in the same way that like meditating has like a wildly like transformative effect kind of gradually being but, thoughtful about every yeah. action that you take all day long so i don't maybe. know like what kind of introduction that was also no, that but, like was, that, that was, was a <laughs> was there you go i'm also an actor but <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit um so that's eight eight years you said package free like meaning your whole life is that's that's a really long time sorry that's that's inspiring um, I, I aged quite a bit. How did you start though? I, I like first days and um, because I think for us that would be interesting to know. I, like for example, there's another actor I work with and, and she, I, Anne Hathaway, who you have, who you're friends with as well. And I was, it's, it's um, I'm, I'm a very curious person. So I started asking like, well, you know, um, I, I tried to not get any cups at the coffee shop, but then I ended up buying eight, you know, reusable cups and I leave them all over the place. And she's like, well, that, the problem with that is that you should only have one and then you're responsible for it, taking responsible responsibility for all your actions. And then when, another thing that was very interesting to me, and this is something that you speak about a lot, is um, like it's sometimes it's things that you wouldn't necessarily, I, I wasn't aware of the Amazon situation. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, one thing that, that Annie told me was with Amazon, the difference um, in terms of environmental impact between doing an overnight versus a two-day um, shipping, it's kind of ex it's extraordinary, like both in terms of the impact on people's jobs and their hours, but like environmentally, the kinds of routes they take and, and that. Ground transportation yeah. versus air transportation. Yeah. Actually, Amazon just like upped their return policy or I guess made it better which in turn makes it a lot worse reverse logistics or returns uh, are one of the most environmentally detrimental practices that yeah. you can participate and in the free um, yeah. and and Amazon makes it really easy to participate in reverse logistics it's one of the biggest contributors to carbon dioxide um, so so that's not good um, oh, and it, excuse me for uh, taking a tangent for a second but back to the first days of your process um, what did that look like for you? And were your friends supportive? Was your family supportive? What were the, and what were the first things that you did? Um, well, it was interesting because when I was in environmental science, I feel like I had to change a lot about how I dressed and a lot around mm. how I did my hair and the way that I spoke. Like granola? Yeah, <laughs> no, but really to fit into this group of people that cared yeah. about the environment, like it almost- Be taken like seriously. I had to look and dress and act a certain way to be somebody who cares about the environment. And that never felt fair to me at all, right? You should be exactly who you are um, and still be able to care about the environment and live like you care about the environment. And um, when I first started reducing my waste, I had a boyfriend at the time. He's from uh, Walnut Creek, California, so Northern California. Um, and a lot of the things that I started doing were things that he had already uh, integrated into his right. life. And, and a lot of the things that I thought were really weird about him, actually. So he used to brush his teeth with baking soda, and I thought that was disgusting. Um, but ironically, the first change that I made was brushing my teeth with baking soda. Wow. Um, but then I added coconut oil and stevia and a few other things to make it taste a little bit better and like look and feel more like conventional toothpaste. Um, but it's really- I think maybe we all try that recipe tonight. <laughs> it's, it's really fun to make your own toothpaste. Um, I like it a lot. No. Um, and you save a lot of money. Uh, but but it's interesting. I the, the phrase zero waste actually, I think, it's really aspirational and amazing and inspiring. I think it can also be a little debilitating because when you hear it, you're like, there's no way that I could possibly do that, right? The average American makes about four and a half pounds of trash per person every single day. That's thousands of pounds of trash per year. That's like taking, you know, a corner of this room and all of us jumping into a landfill. Like that's how much waste that is just for one person. That's what we generate. And so the thought of making zero is like, no way, you liar. Mm -hmm. um, but when you zoom in and you look at the changes that I was making every day, like um, 
you know, not using plastic water bottles or starting to compost. Compost, food waste is one of the largest contributors of waste to our landfill. By composting, um, I was able to remove a huge amount of the volume of my trash, but also have a hugely positive environmental impact. If there's one thing that everyone in this room could start doing that would have a really large scale positive impact, it would be composting. And if you live in New York City, it's pretty convenient to compost at all of our farmers markets and for those of us that are lucky enough to have brown bins at our house. But, but putting food or something organic into a landfill creates methane, which is exponentially more detrimental of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So compostable cups, throwing them in the trash is a terrible idea. Really bad for climate change, putting food into a landfill. Really bad idea. That's a, I wish Nothing breaks they would down say in that landfill. though in, in yeah. coffee. And again, I, 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 I do too. believe that we should all be having our um, reusable cups, but most coffee shops now as a solution, they're offering compostable cups and don't offer composting. Right. Yeah. So it's, oh. it's ironic. It's a very like cart before the horse yeah. type of a problem, yeah. but uh, composting is amazing. It's a great thing to do. You guys were doing it. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that's a great place to start. But, but then you look at like saying no to a plastic bag. Okay, I can do that. Saying no to a straw. I can probably do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, swapping out a plastic razor for a stainless steel razor. I can do that. Um, the, so the menstrual cups I saw on your site, I didn't I know if that was actually cups. a feasible option for oh most God. people. <laughs> menstrual cups are amazing. <laughs> If you have not used them or heard of them before, they're alternatives. I don't know. So I, I always talk about periods. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Happy Fashion Week. Um, uh, but a menstrual cup is an alternative to a tampon or a pad. They can save you thousands of dollars over the course of your life because actually single-use tampons and pads are very expensive. Um, they last up to 10 years and they replace all single-use period products. You have effectively zero risk of toxic so shock syndrome, which is amazing. Um, 12 hours, you leave them for 12, 12 hours. hours. You don't have to change it every time you go to the bathroom. And um, you can have someone go down on you while you're wearing them. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> that is the best thing I've ever heard. about tampons. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and that's sustainable. Only yeah. <laughs> um, I, that is, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Just, just You're so welcome. you know, um, I, the slogan of your shop is everything you need to live a zero waste lifestyle in one place. And so keep that in mind when, if, or if you decide to invest in that piece, it's part of everything you need. Um, <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> Willa, um, we, we featured Willa, <laughs> wink, wink, wink. Um, Willa's feature with our subject journal is up today. You can check it out at subjectjournal.com. But one thing, a couple of the many articulate things you addre just addressed in there was that you said, I want my legacy to be that of a curious and engaged human who is a loyal and dedicated friend, cl collaborator, and col colleague. To me, being an activist is being an engaged citizen, organizing, voting, showing up, and speaking up. And that, um, I guess my question is for you, in terms of being an engaged citizen, what does that, how do you, how, like on a daily basis, what does that look like for you? Like, is that something that, I'm not saying when you wake up in the morning, it's like, how am I going to be an engaged citizen today? Or is it? Like, do you actually think that way? And should um, we? I do kind of think that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, in the same way that I think going package free, going zero waste can be like big ideas to think about. Um, I think that being an engaged citizen, especially right now in this moment where there's a lot of things that feel catastrophic and overwhelming and like kind of debilitatingly horribly huge, it's really easy to kind of, I think I see a lot of my friends being just kind of fatalistic about it and being like, well, the world's going to like be gone in 20 years, so we should all take a trip to Fiji now, you know, which is like, okay, that's a way to feel, but I don't really think that that's the way that I, I want or like, to what's the go point? out if we're going to go out in 20 years. And so I think that like, I kind of, I mean, I do think it's how you wake up in the morning. I wake up, I make time to read the news, which I think is something that we should all like just baseline be informed about what's going on in the world that we live hard, in. Hard to do. Most it is. It is. Necessary. You just like, you know, set it aside, like do it after your coffee and then do it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes and then move on. Um, but I think that it's, it's also getting local, like hyper local. I think that in the same way that you've made a decision that is hyper personal and affects every choice that you make in your daily life. I think that, 
it, changes happen on both a micro and a macro level. And if you're able to engage on the micro level, so whether that's like organizing the co-op that you live in to, you know, make sure that the recyclables are actually being recycled or whatever the like micro change is that you're making in your community that's either the building that you live in, the neighborhood that you live in, the school district that you go to, the set that you're working mm -hmm. on as an actor, sets are hugely problematic in terms of environmental impact in lots of ways. And if you like are the person to make the first um, like statement or question or the first step towards organizing, the people respond like amazingly. They respond and especially in this room with people who might happen to know or be leaders in an industry, whether it's fashion, entertainment, otherwise by making those micro changes as a leader, yeah. that's when you really start to influence communities and yeah. you know, start start to change things on a micro level. That's, yeah. that's incredible. That's and I think that it's also, I mean, this organization that I've supported for a while, the NRDC, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, did um, a documentary a year and a half ago called From Paris to Pittsburgh that um, was basically about after the Paris Climate Agreement um, and all of the ways in which that agreement was not being met by the people who had agreed to it, the governments, um, a lot of local communities started taking <clears throat> hyper-local actions to make those changes real in their communities to get to net uh, zero carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that was a really inspiring documentary uh, for me and for everyone in this time where like everything feels kind of so catastrophic, especially as we approach the markers of, you know, um, climate collapse, ecosystem collapse, and the things that are very real that we are approaching probably won't be able to totally avoid. Um, right. So. Um, Act local. Well, and, and remember that film. I think everybody should see it. Yeah, from you should Paris definitely see that film. From Paris to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about um, what... I, I'm curious, too, business-wise, what you have going on these days. I know that you've, you've currently... You've taken on funding to support your enterprise. Um, now that you are a leader in what you're doing, which is a huge responsibility... Um, how does that work for you to be both a responsible business person and a person who is um, growing an enterprise at the same time as you know making those micro steps every day and being influential in that way? Like, what is what does that look to you that that dichotomy? I think it it comes back to there's a lot of I mean I guess that's why we're on a panel together but there's a lot <laughs> of similarities between um, I think what happened to me before even the environmental like tangible shift in the way that I was living was a way a tangible shift in the way that I was thinking which was that for the first time in my life I asked myself what are my values what do I care about and what do I want the world to look like and am I living in alignment with that every single day um, and it sounds so much like what you seem to do every morning when you wake up and, and truly I do the same thing I wake up and I'm like okay large scale positive environmental change is my day aligning with that. And I know it sounds crazy, but uh, it's like really having intentions and, and mm -hmm. checking in with myself to make sure I'm, I'm aligning myself towards them and, and working and moving towards them. Um, and when I started to do that, I had such a such an ability to do gut checks to see if the, the choices that I was making in my life aligned both mentally, narrative-wise, but but also physically with the things that I was wanting. I think your body tells you when you're yeah. on the right path. Your instincts are real. They, yeah, they instincts tell you are when. totally real, but you can be aligning yourself towards something that you don't want if you're not sure about what you want the world to look like and what your values are. Um, so one of the most important exercises that I ever did was ask myself, you know, what do I care about? What do I want the world to look like? And am I living in alignment with those values every single day? Um, I do that exercise annually as like a, a refresh, but I also do it uh, monthly and I do it daily. I set my intentions and, and I think that really helped me. So I know I exactly you to write this out for us. what this I want. Interesting. Um, and it, it, it's helped me so much. And I did this eight years ago when I started oh. living a zero waste lifestyle. How old were you eight years ago, um, by the way? 21? Oh, was I 20? That's amazing. I was 20. I'm 28. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 28. Um, and uh, that, that really led me towards making the decision to quit my first job, which was in uh, engineering, working for the city, doing capital infrastructure. I was managing like $5 billion of capital infrastructure projects, helping to make them more sustainable. Um, 
seemingly align with my values, mm -hmm. but actually because I wanted to make large scale positive impact, I wasn't making the type of change in that job that I wanted to be making. And that led me to think about business because I think business is such an incredible way to make large scale change quickly without all of the red tape that you see in politics or other types of- Especially when it's your own. Yeah, when it's your own. Like, there's basically, when it comes to manufacturing products or starting a business, there is, in a scary way, so little regulation, you can kind of do whatever you want. I mean, I owned a, a beauty cleaning industry. product company. Yeah, I mean, in cleaning and in beauty. Um, I owned a cleaning product company, and I'm uh, reintroducing that into the market very soon, but for years, and nobody ever regulated the ingredients that I had in it. It was a chemical company. Um, the same thing happens with beauty. There are over 85,000 industrial chemicals that are used in cleaning and beauty products. Uh, there's basically none that are tested for safety. I think we have like 12 regulated in the United States. It's, it's insane. Same. The way that they're tested for safety or taken off of the market is because someone gets really sick, um, which is not okay. Mm -hmm. And and so that really inspired me to get into business. And, and I started Package Free really to make it easier for other people who, like me, wanted to have a positive impact on the environment, but didn't know where to start or didn't have convenient access to the tools that make it easier. Um, so, so we started two years ago. I just took on funding uh, in July for the first time, which was a whole Amazing. thing in and of itself. Only 2.2% of venture capital money goes to women, which is crazy. That needs to change. Um, and, and really our goal now with Package Free is to start manufacturing lifestyle products, like the products you use every day, like toothbrushes and shampoo. That's, that's very exciting because what you were just saying in terms of the chemicals found, the XYZ chemicals found where, number one, I would be curious, I'm, I'm so excited that you might be producing something because that would be the easiest solution just to go to her shop and not have to worry about right? looking at any chemicals on any um, We want to make them packaging. affordable because right yeah, now like sustainable that's... products aren't affordable. So we want to start manufacturing them at economies of scale so that um, if you shop at Walmart or CVS or the yeah. local corner store, you too can afford those products. Even if you don't care about sustainability, you can yeah. have access to them. Yeah, I, I think that that's one of the hugest challenges in, in terms of socioeconomic scale is making these, I, I think that's like making them wide, wide, like available on a widespread scale. Um, and I think that's why the these small right things, and no, that's it's not. not. Okay. It's, it's, it's really frustrating. I mean, what's, to, to both of you and, and Willa, what, what, is, what are things that you see people do in terms of these kinds of choices that you just can't stomach that are pet peeves or, and af after we get into this, I would love to take it out to the audience. Uh, well, my biggest pet peeve is when I see people throw away clothes. Oh, yeah. Like, when there's clothes that are either left on the stoops of a brownstone for people to take, which, like, yes, maybe happens in some neighborhoods sometimes, but most of those clothes get rained on, peed on, they aren't taken, yeah. they then are thrown away by the city. I mean, I think throwing away clothes, since this is a sustainability panel at New York Fashion Week, is, I think, like, Pretty egregious, and I know so many people who do it, and there's so many easy ways. I mean, Thread Up, I don't know if you know about Thread Up, is, and I don't know what you think about them, but I think they're pretty great. <laughs> they recycle, they will, basically it's a consignment. You send in your clothes, um, they send you a bag, you send it back, and um, anything that they don't sell, they recycle. And textile recycling is less easy to find in the city, easier to send away. Um, and so I think that's my biggest pet peeve. Th th and th also th throwing up. away com. furniture. Um, yeah, threadup.com. Um, and, and just furniture being on the side of the street. That kind of like, that kind of, and, and we all have done it. Like, we have certainly have all done it. But I think I first became aware of that massive, like, purging of clothes in undergrad. Uh, I went to Yale, and there's a thing called Spring Salvage. Everyone moves in May, either, you know, to go back home, whatever. And basically, all of the students just, their blue bins, and everything gets thrown into these blue bins. And then uh, I worked Spring Salvage, and so that meant I sorted through everyone's trash and um, basically sorted through things that could be sold uh, back to the community or you know at very low prices. Um, and that was furniture, clothing, et cetera, or we recycled the textiles or we recycled the, the furniture that was destroyed or whatever. Um, and it was like this massive effort and I thought it, it was part of the recycling program. It was created uh, by this guy, CJ, who lived in New Haven. And it was like a huge step in like getting rid of like student waste because that's like obviously in the same way that 
private sets at the end of a production, there's a ton of stuff that just like gets largely thrown away. At the end of a school year, there's a ton of stuff that has to get out of a dormitory that people bought for like a short period of time and no longer want to have around. And so I think also thinking about your consumption choices in terms of longevity um, and like how long is it that you're going to want to have that thing that you just bought. I think a lot of people have things that they no longer want and then they don't know what to do with them, so they default to throwing them into a landfill. But there are so many amazing resources to divert things from landfill. Like textile waste thread up is amazing. There's also, while fast fashion is awful, um, H&M and Zara both have textile recycling programs, which is a great byproduct of them being so massive. It's interesting. I, I'm totally aware of that, but the frustrating for thing thing for me being American is my husband is Swedish and they're so much more aware of this program than we are here. I mean, I suppose they're more conscious that way as a collective country anyways, but I think it's definitely something that we should spread the word here. Textile recycling is, is really convenient, especially in fast fashion. And yeah. there's also things like TerraCycle where you can recycle like beauty product packaging, even cigarette butts, dirty diapers. Um, so we have those boxes at Package Free available for people I'm to coming for their that. waste to Package Free, <laughs> things like batteries, um, anything that the city won't recycle. So there are places for you to divert waste from landfill. Um, trash is for tossers. I have a whole list of those resources for people. Everyone should check that out. So I'd like to take it to the audience. I'm sure some of you have some questions. Um, Judy there has the microphone. She's going to pass it around. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just going to ask, like, in a career like something like acting, um, how do you balance having this kind of, and, you know, I know you haven't talked much about the acting, so I, like, could be uh, off with this, but um, how do you balance the sort of, like, activist side? Like, there are so many issues, like, I personally care about. Definitely sustainability is one of them. And, you know, a career in entertainment or a career that's maybe not all about what your kind of, like, activism side is also interested in. I don't know. But your acting could have something to do with it. So that could be a redundant question. But um, Yes, I think that, I think that um, the funny thing about being an actor is that you as you start working more and more, you also become someone who people recognize, you become someone who has some degree of social capital, for better, for worse. And I think that in in engaging with that, for me, I think that I'm only interested in really engaging with it if it means that I can therefore spread the word about things that I believe in and that I think can bring about positive change. Like I have zero interest in being a celebrity or a socialite for the pure value of like being, I don't know, taken pictures of. <laughs> and so I think that like there, you know, and especially Instagram, like how do I use Instagram? I try to use it in a way that feels good for me, which generally means also including things that I want to bring to people's attention, whether that's political, social, environmental, um, whatever it is. And so I think that, and I also think that in terms of being an actor specifically and a storyteller and someone who's interested in narratives and, um, and also just community, I think that, uh, it's ki it kind of does go hand in hand. There are a lot of um, ways in which I want to live in a community of humans that means that I want to live amongst those humans who also care about you know, other humans and the earth and uh, the choices that we're all making. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? <laughs> Great. I, sorry, I just want to give you a moment to talk about, um, in, in terms of one of the Act of, like one of the causes that you believe in that you told me about was um, a thousand currents in Nepal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just recently went to um, Nepal in November with this organization, Thousand Currents, um, which is a, a foundation that offers um, grants to communities in the global south to basically um, combat climate change, food food sovereignty, land use issues, and um, they work with uh, both grassroots movements and um, individual groups of people, communities that are largely led by indigenous people, women, um, people of color, and um, they in Nepal really work with like kind of grassroots movements and it was a really profoundly moving experience to go there and talk to all of the Nepalese people that they are working with and to see the ways in which um, a lot of these communities in a very short amount of time had been able to really reimagine um, what community looks like, what structures of community are and that's partially because 
the structures of community that were there were a product of capitalism and they don't need capitalism because they're not being served by capitalism. Whereas we are all being served by capitalism and therefore it's much more difficult to um, to combat because we are the, the winners of capitalism in that sense. And so I think that I left um, Nepal deeply moved and um, deeply like excited and also like very, um, confused about my own part in capitalism and uh and i mean i think it's it's a great organization if you're looking for a more kind of global reach and also an organization that has um just like really good i think ethics uh when it comes to philanthropy which is a complicated kind of field um and yeah so i think that that's that's a kind of more global um side of my interest in environmentalism and social change I, I love your question, though, because um, on, on several levels, anybody in this room is, it's not just that, so you're an actor and you're an activist or, you know, you're an entrepreneur and a creative and a force, <laughs> or, or, you know, I promise I'm not just a stylist. Um, I think we're all so many things, so by consciously acting on all the layers that we are every day and engaging with that, and I, I need to write down the steps that you do because that's incredibly inspiring. I think remembering all those layers every day is a piece of, hopefully becoming a better human, an example for the people that we get to interact with. So I'm sure somebody else has a question. Hi, this is for Lauren. Um, mega fan. Uh, wondering how you went from something um, really different, I guess, with the engineering, feeling like you were out of place, and get to starting the company. Did you have a business background? Did you... Was it like the traditional like, aha, like I realize there's a hole here? Was it a series of years where things were coming together? Like what was the process that let you bring this into the world um, and then find a way to grow it? It's a really good question. I, I really think that knowing what my value system was is what helped and I'm also, um, my mom always said to me that there's nothing in life that's permanent except for death and STDs. So, um, <laughs> so I always felt really safe quitting. Um, a lot of people feel really scared to quit, like their life or their world will be over, and I never had that fear. You know, I was always financially responsible and very grateful to the first job that I had for being able to give me the financial stability to save up some money and be able to quit my job. But um, I started Simply Co. through a Kickstarter um, had no idea how to start a company. I was hand making laundry detergent by literally grinding it in a coffee grinder and baking baking soda to make one of the ingredients in my kitchen. Um, and then I closed my, or the Kickstarter ended and I had to make like 2000 jars of detergent in my <laughs> kitchen by hand. I had like myself, my friends and my mom for like months wearing particle masks in my apartment, like making this stuff. Like, so to answer your question, no, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't obviously did not have a business background. Um, $40,000 that I raised was like an arbitrary number that I was like, this sounds right. Um, and, and really all I've learned is that I don't know how to do much, but I know that I can figure things out. Um, so even when it came to fundraising, I didn't know the first thing about fundraising six months ago, and I was just in my office today uh, explaining what an IPO was to my entire team. And I don't know how I know that. I guess it's through like... Um, osmosis or something, but I think just knowing that uh, you have the ability to learn anything, that, that even if something feels really hard, there are baby steps that you can take to approach it. So I never, I never try to look at big problems. I look at like what's right in front of me and how I can solve it to work towards finding a solution. Um, when I started Simply Code, the idea of screen printing, first of all, the idea of buying jars was like crazy hard to me. The idea of screen printing jars felt impossible. Um, and now I'm looking at manufacturing over you know, 200 products over the next three years. And so like, it's something that I've just realized that these things feel really scary, but you have to trust yourself and just know that you can figure it out. Um, but also, well, but while also always being smart and having you know financial stability, uh, I, I think Kickstarter was amazing for starting my company because I was able to create a product market fit validation for my company. You shouldn't just quit your job and start a random company without knowing whether or not people are going to like it. Kickstarter is a great validator for that. You know, trying to sell on the side. I was writing trashes for tossers while I was still working. So. So I think, 
uh, trying things out, testing it, but being brave and bold. And if you're not happy, it's probably because you're not in alignment with your values and you should probably make a change. Uh, my favorite quote is, uh, when you're no longer able to change a situation, you're challenged to change yourself. Um, and I, I really try to live by that. Hi, this is a question for Lauren. Um, so I know you mentioned as you're living your zero waste lifestyle and removing all plastics from your life. I was wondering um, how you went about removing all synthetics from your wardrobe and um, what challenges you run into and um, like, like where do you shop or how, how do you really remove all synthetics from everything you wear? So there's definitely things that I still wear that have synthetics that I buy secondhand, which isn't ideal, but I like to think that because I wash things more responsibly, meaning I put them in a guppy friend bag or use like a microfiber uh, capturing bag, that that helps to extend the life of something that would have gone into landfills, um, while also keeping those particulates out of our oceans because uh, microfiber uh, waste or the, the little fuzz that sheds off of our clothing when we wash it that goes into our, our washing machine and into our water systems is one of the biggest problems facing our oceans that people aren't talking about yet. Um, so, so synthetic clothing, even if made from recycled materials, is not good ever. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind if you are someone in the audience that, uh, that makes clothing out of recycled uh, water bottles or something like that. It seems uh, upfront like it's a good choice, but actually it has a long-term negative impact um, and we shouldn't support uh, those practices. But I think uh, that that's a bigger conversation about understanding systems thinking and the effects of the choices that we're making, not just in the short-term narrative, but in the long-term impact. So where do I shop? I My favorite place, if, you, if I'm not at my office or at my house, it's probably Beacon's Closet. Um, has anyone shopped there before? Yeah. It's amazing. Um, but I also love Poshmark, ThreadUp is great, The Real Real. Um, for people who want to rent things, Rent the Runway is, is awesome. Um, and there are brands that are creating better products. Um, a designer that I really love is Maggie Marilyn. Mm -hmm. um, she had a line of, of more high-end products, but now she just released a new brand of basics that we were talking about recently mm -hmm. um, that are made from sustainable materials. Uh, what is it? Is it, what's the name of the t-shirt company? Do you remember? Four days. Um, you can buy a t-shirt from them and then it's basically a subscription service so you can send it, send your t-shirt back for $13, get a new t-shirt and then they disassemble the t-shirt, clean the fibers and then reassemble a new shirt. So that's amazing. So there are- Four days, but four you don't wear it four times. You wear it many times. <laughs> F-O-R. Four days. days. Four days, you can wear it for days. <laughs> Sorry. And send it back and get a new one. Um, but, but there are really cool innovations that make buying new items possible. Um, but when I do shop secondhand, I, I try really, really hard to buy all natural fibers, not synthetics. And if I do buy synthetics, I um, try to be really responsible and wash them in a washing bag, which we sell at Packetry, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a great question because I feel like this panel is kind of a starting point for where we're going to go. And in this room of fashion industry insiders. Um, I think it will become, and it, it is relevant now, but we're sort of getting to that place of asking those questions about responsible practices, who's practicing them, where do we look for better solutions, how do we find them, and some, you know, at the forefront of this. So I, I think that's a place that we'll be getting into very soon. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.